recording. Excellent. Thank you, Alice. So let me very quickly give you a very quick introduction. So integrating sustainable development goals into energy system modeling. This is the main topic of our series that start today, continue in 27th of, uh, on 20th of January and also in 10th of February. So the energy transition and sustainability requires new technologies like electrification of heating and mobility, renewable energy supply, green hydrogen, CO2 capture, utilization and storage and negative emission technologies. But all these technologies have non-energy impacts. They are associated with direct costs and burdens, with environmental impacts, with health impacts, with severe accident and social aspects and others. And when we are doing energy system modeling, actually, we are a very small part. We are here in this highlighted yellow circle uh, in the complete energy system analysis. And what you see here is the complex framework of energy system analysis that we have at PSI Laboratory for Energy System Analysis, where we integrate energy system analysis with additional methodologies in order to account for the sustainability of technologies and uh, ma mainly with uh, life cycle analysis, with externalities and uh, other tools, including multi-criteria decision assessment. And uh, questions, for instance, that we can answer by broadening the analysis of uh, beyond the energy system is that uh, how the technologies perform not only on the climate change, uh, which is this first chart here, and here we see the example of electric cars, for example, uh, compared to other types of drive drivetrains for, for vehicles. And we see that indeed the electric vehicles have the lower CO2 emissions per vehicle kilometers. But when we are expanding the, the scope of the analysis, we can see the performance of electric cars, for instance, in the energy that is, is needed in order to produce it, or on the human toxicity, or in the mineral depletion, and then the sustainability of this technology changes. Another example is, for example, how green is the hydrogen from gasification and indeed we know that if we are using biomethane or wood we have negative perhaps direct emissions but if we account for the life cycle of this technology are these emissions really negative or for instance the direct air capture how much is the carbon removal efficiency of the direct air capture and we can see here that when we install direct air capture in countries where electricity is mostly based on renewable energy, like Switzerland, we have a carbon removal efficiency of 80%. But if we are talking on countries like Greece, for example, where it's carbon intensive, the carbon removal efficiency of the technology from the life cycle perspective drops to 9%. So, Integrating sustainability and all its dimensions, environmental, societal, and economic, in energy systems modeling is important. And the ATSAP community has performed several model developments and knowledge exchanging so far on modeling the water energy nexus in Zurich in 2017, on sustainable performance of the energy system in CMAT in 2017 on models and applications and on linking energy models and economic models. In these three workshops that are started today, we are seeking to improve our knowledge on methodologies and required data to integrate sustainability into energy systems modeling, to provide insights on the value added that is gained in for policy analysis by expanding our methodologies and to get insights on synergies and trade-offs between sustainable development goals and energy transition. And having saying that, I would like now to hand over to Professor Maizi to introduce today's webinar and our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, um, Evangelos. 
Um, so uh, I would like, first of all, to uh, say Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, to introduce myself, so I'm Nadia Maisy, I'm the head of the Center for Applied Mathematics uh, of uh, the Ecole des Mines de Paris in France, and I'm a member of uh, the IPCC. I'm a lead author for the Chapter 5 in Working Group 3. The chapter is dedicated to demand services and social aspects of mitigation. And I'm very happy to be uh, the host of uh, the virtual host of this first um, uh, webinar series um, dedicated to the resilience and sustainability of power systems with high shares of renewables. So uh, in his introduction, uh, Panos has told us that it's very difficult to in fact uh, embed these uh, SDGs in the framework of uh, energy system modeling, but I would like to remind you with uh, the fact that um, these SDGs are um, effectively uh, not uh, uh, very um, specific. And uh, uh, even if they have been defined in, in 2015 um, through the United Nations General Assemblies as um, goals, 17 goals and uh, 169 targets, um, uh, it's kind of uh, difficult to uh, really um, assess them in the framework of uh, modeling, uh, long-term planning, and um, specifically because uh, what they uh, aim to is to transform the world by ensuring sim simultaneously human well-being, economic prosperity, and environmental protection. Uh, so what we would like to do in uh, these three webinars is to try to illustrate how we can try um, to give um, uh, an assessment uh, in order to understand if uh, this uh, policy is happening. And I would like to remind you also that these goals um, have been set for 2030. Uh, that is to say, uh, we have eight years left. So in this uh, uh, first session, uh, we'll tackle um, the relationship between uh, SDGs and energy systems uh, by talking about uh, the idea of uh, penetration of high shares of renewables. And we will have three talks um, that uh, will try to enlighten us uh, with uh, different point of views. Uh, first, um, I'm uh, very happy to introduce um, Kirsten uh, Alsnae from uh, DTU, Denmark. Um, she's um, a member also of IPCC and uh, she's co coordinating uh, lead author of the chapter 17 of uh, Working Group 3. Uh, I didn't say that, but this working group is dedicated to uh, mitigation solutions. And this chapter um, is entitled Accelerating the Transition in the Context of Sustainable Development. And uh, so Kirsten is going to talk about um, the sustainable development perspectives on energy modeling. And I would like to tell you that we uh, propose uh, the following rules. Uh, we will have the three talks uh, and then we will have a question and a session, but uh, between the different talks, if you have specific technical questions, uh, you, uh, can, uh, uh, you can ask them. And uh, what I will do is uh, in order to moderate the discussion, uh, take the questions um, written in the chat. Uh, and then we'll reorganize them in order to um, have a smooth discussion with the uh, three speakers. So Kirsten, um, I thank you very much for being with us and I let you the flow. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm so glad to know that, uh, that you as energy modelers and experts are so much aware of sustainable development. So I'll try to share my uh, 
screen with the presentation. Is it working now? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, so uh, what I will do is to uh, to discuss the sustainable development perspective in relation to energy modeling in a sort of general way and not go into detail about details about specific energy system models because um, I know that this is your main expertise. So this is what you can really do. So uh, let us move on. My scope is um, more or less the basic assumption that this transformation to uh, low temperature targets will need to include all countries in the world, and it would be uh, high income countries, it would be least developed countries, and therefore framing uh, emission reductions into uh, sustainable development is simple, simply the only way we can meet these uh, stabilization targets. And this is why we need to uh, Really, as and I think you said that very rightly, Nadia, that is quite complicated to expand our energy modeling perspective to be more on sustainable development. And in the chapter I'm uh, co leading together with Fatima Denton from Ghana, we are trying really to dig into the literature on uh, also modeling literature because we want to be very empirical also and try to show and to assess how different models have uh, been uh, assessing synergies and trade-offs of sustainable development and energy. And uh, we also have the role as a concluding part of a uh, chapter of all other chapters. So this is not too easy to, to try to provide this uh, broad overview. As you know, um, the report is confidential until it is uh, presented at the press conference uh, uh, for April. So uh, I cannot show you any figures or specific results. The only thing I can do is to uh, provide some more overall insights based on literature. And I think that will inspire you to think about how this really would, will play out. So uh, what I will do is to uh, share some few examples uh, with you of how international energy research in terms of integrated assessment models have assessed synergies and trade-offs between uh, low stabilization scenarios in the, in the energy sector and uh, the sustainable development goals. And then I will also spend some time discussing how this could be done in the context of developing countries, where access to energy affordability and income generation are key objectives. We are very much in the coming IPCC uh, report focusing on synergies and trade-off issues, because we think it's a major criteria in decision-making to see whether we can align uh, climate change mitigation objectives and benefits in terms of um, sustainable development goals. So we are trying, uh, based on the review of all these uh, available studies, to map uh, synergies and trade-offs. And we need to, uh, we want to do it in a very concrete way because we think that um, Sometimes in climate discussions, we are paving, uh, uh, painting a too rosy picture. It doesn't help that we are saying that, okay, it's good to uh, implement renewable energy because you also have benefits on local air pollution something. We have to be more specific and more open about where we could see trade-offs and conflicts because we don't get everybody on board, all countries in the world, rich and poor, if you're not able to um, address the trade-offs. So I'll go a bit into the trade-off issues also, 
because I think these trade-offs actually can be addressed, but it's not a good idea just to, uh, to neglect them. And uh, I would also like to conclude that the uh, very general uh, statements like what we see from some integrated assessment models is that uh, like the benefits uh, globally of mitigation exceed the cost. Uh, and they say this in a very general way. It's okay, but I don't think it's very helpful to, to know that for uh, for the world in, in, in total, the benefit exceeds the cost. Because we need to know why you have cost of going for uh, uh, transformation to very low uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, so uh, I would also like to emphasize that uh, these uh, trade-off and synergy issues are very much linked to issues like, uh, like just transition and stranded assets, because, uh, and that was, I think, a very important uh, new thing coming out of the Glasgow meeting, that we are really so much going into dealing with implementing these uh, emission reduction scenarios. That uh, and the fossil fuels would have to be phased out uh, in the near future, which means that uh, we have to face uh, that some countries and some economic sectors would have an interest in not going into that because they have losses and uh, that has to be addressed. In terms of policy relevant questions, which I think is very important for you as modelers and also for uh, in, in the IPCC context. It's, it's uh, in the energy sector planning perspective. The way I see it, it is very much from considering specific mitigation options to what are the impacts on the sustainable development goals. So we are more or less uh, examining if you want to change the energy system in, in a specific way, what would be the impact on the sustainable development goals? But then we also know that there are limitations in what an energy system model can uh, address, but there are still very important sustainable development impacts of changing the energy systems, for example, in terms of uh, renewable energy, and I will get a little bit uh, closer into that. Another very policy relevant question is what can be considered as being uh, green energy options? You have this new uh, EU sort of uh, shortlist, uh, and, and that's quite important because uh, I think if we uh, also face um, green investments and finance, which I think will drive the transformation to a very wide extent. extent. Then we need to know what uh, people would like to invest in. For example, if our sort of um, pension funds would invest in this and that, uh, it's, it's an issue that becomes more and more important to us as uh, as also having our own pension in, in these funds. Um, one of the problem when we have, uh, when we look at energy model structures and sustainable development is that um, the energy system models are structured around technologies and systems. So in this way, we can very well address sustainable development goal seven on energy access, and we can also model cost. We can model air pollution, other health issues, energy for education, health clinics, industry, and so forth. But there are some very important uh, SDG issues that are difficult to uh, model in energy system models. So we have to supplement our models with other models. And uh, this is, for example, land use models, because if we want to use uh, high um, shares of uh, bioenergy crops in our energy system model, then we are really influencing some other important um, sustainable development aspects. And another issue which we don't include too well in our model, of course, is all these uh, 
socioeconomic sustainability uh, aspects, like uh, human and societal uh, development, and we need to supplement with uh, models that can also address energy access, income generation that way, and this is what I'm trying to illustrate uh, with the pictures I, I have on the slide here. So then I will try to uh, spend a little bit time on some integrated assessment modeling uh, results in order to get to uh, some first conclusions about where you see synergies and where you see uh, trade-offs. And this is a study for Asia with uh, integrated assessment models <clears throat> supplemented with more detailed land use and other sort of agricultural models and, and things like that. And uh, I know there's a lot of information on this uh, slide, but what we can take a look at is all the, all the yellow lines, because this is our sustainability sort of scenario. Uh, where we are going for uh, very low temperature change here in terms of only 1.5 degree temperature change. And the interesting thing, of course, is that the uh, how's the yellow line compared with the baseline and the other lines. And uh, as you can see on the first uh, figure here in the, in the left top, there could be a risk of more people at hunger if you go for the low temperature goals, agricultural prices could increase. You would have lower air pollution. This is a synergy. But you could have, uh, here it says that uh, you would have a lower number of people under water scarcity that can be discussed, of course. You will have more renewable energy. You have, uh, the GDP rate is not so affected here. The food waste is uh, decreasing and you have more forest uh, area. What I think uh, this is pointing to, of course, is that, uh, again, is, is in a way what I said already, if we use a lot of land for bioenergy or for renewable energy uh, facilities, then we have to really be careful and also manage uh, issues of food access, agriculture and other sort of issues because else we are getting into potential trade-offs. Another study that I have here from uh, integrated assessment uh, models uh, is showing here you can focus on the on the blue lines which are a sustainable development scenario for 1.5 showing that uh, a lot of the issues like in the middle here, agricultural water use is decreasing with this scenario. We are also having a, a extreme poverty decreasing. And uh, here you have like uh, food waste. The blue scenario here has actually, and this is the interesting point about this study, it has a lot of additional scenario assumptions. It's not only reducing emissions, it's also assuming that you are having uh, financial support from high income countries to the transition. You are having big changes in the diets and uh, you are sharing the, the revenue of CO2 taxes and other things. So what this points to is that you, if you really want to go do these good things, you also need to have additional policies. The figure I have here is from the IPC 1.5 report. You may be know that already, but this is uh, mapping how energy supply and demand is influencing uh, sustainable development goals with the uh, blue are the synergies, the brown are the trade-offs, and uh, they get into um, issues on uh, water and, uh, and food supply and so forth. So, uh, what I can conclude based on that, and this is only concluded based on these integrated assessment models, because we also have sectoral models, is that there could be trade-offs between some energy supply options and land use related to bioenergy crops, renewable energy facilities, and so forth. Also on water demand, 
for energy and agriculture, and we have all the nexus issues. We could have problems with no poverty, zero hunger, biodiversity is an issue also. But in relation to synergies, we also have uh, synergies for some options in relation to no poverty, education, health, industry, and so forth. The good thing, maybe, if you are doing IPCC review, is that uh, there's a large agreement across modeling studies. So I expect that out of this IPCC assessment, we will actually be able to do some very robust conclusions about why we need supplementary policies and finance in order to um, ensure that we are avoiding these uh, trade-offs. Then I will uh, talk a little bit about a study for Ghana, where I have participated, and that goes a little bit more into these renewable energy issues also because I think it's very important that more studies uh, very soon would be done for countries like Ghana, because uh, they have some more serious, I would say, sustainable development issues related to energy access, income generation, and, and these issues. And if you look uh, at the top left corner, then... Uh, no, I made some drawing on my slide. It's, it's, uh, don't just forget about that. You can see that this is a very conventional sort of renewable energy scenario called climate smart and the business as usual. And uh, in the period until 2050, you can reduce uh, emissions a lot and you can have a lot of uh, renewable energy. And this is uh, assessed based on a very detailed uh, assessment of how Hydropower, solar energy, and wind energy can play together. And this is all good. The only problem is how to do that in practice. Because um, as uh, we know, in the uh, Ghana is still uh, developing their sort of uh, energy access for all. And they're still uh, investing in uh, in fossil fuel based uh, power, grid based power plants, like uh, based on natural gas and so forth. And then uh, one thing that I was considering, sorry, was uh, what about the poverty issue? Because uh, in, in the northern part of Ghana, you have the three poorest region, like the northern, the upper east, and the upper west. And if you take a look at the uh, the left uh, side table I have here is from the from the income expenditure survey. You can see that, uh, for example, in the upper west, we only have fifty six percent of the household with a connection to the national grid, and the connections uh, to all the small grids and the uh, private generators and so forth is very small. But the target of the government is to, uh, to have uh, access for all in 2050, uh, 2030. But then if you turn to the left, not to the right, then you also have an assessment of uh, why people are not having access. And it's fair enough, take the first uh, row, which is too far away, maybe. But this is not the only reason why people are not connected. It's also that the cost of electricity is too high. The monthly fees are high. Company may be refused to connect and other reasons. So the reason why I want to show that is that the income generation is uh, pretty important. If you are really getting people on this system because if, uh, if you also want to include uh, low income households, uh, on, on the electricity, then you need to do something which is also addressing how, um, how the economy in this part of, uh, of Ghana is developing. And then uh, what I would like to share with you here is that I thought it could maybe be a good idea to, uh, to use some sort of standard indicators, which could be used to evaluate how electrification for example, in terms of renewable energy, 
could help to meet some of these uh, developing goals, development goals. And in terms of energy demand, it could be ability to pay for electricity, the willingness to pay. We could also measure the quantity and type of energy supplied, but also uh, reliability, which is a major issue. And uh, of course, the cost and affordability issues. We could uh, look at the water, food and energy uh, trade-offs and synergies irrigation, electricity for irrigation and pumping and drinking water, and the land use for biomass for the energy system. Then uh, income generation is important. Energy for production for water and profit uh, for the energy companies and services. I think it's very important who are actually owning these uh, local uh, renewable energy facilities also, how do we share the cost and, and the benefit? Another issue is how the access to the markets for people getting the electricity. Do they have an opportunity actually, if they were able to produce something to go to the market and get a fair price? This is quite important. And then of course we have the education and the health issues and that has been covered in a lot of uh, development studies. Then, uh, Going to uh, conclusions, the common conclusions on uh, how energy and uh, the SDGs come together is that we have land use conflicts, we have, uh, and but also potential synergies, if this is managed right, we have uh, issues related to energy and food access and the cost, we have employment issues, and uh, we also have some biodiversity in relation to land. I think that green finance could play a very important role in reaching the low stabilization targets. And therefore, I think that more should be done. And this was why I was suggesting these uh, energy indicators. We should make a more complete assessment of the cost and benefits uh, of different renewable energy facilities in developing countries because you need to make them ready for finance. And this also means that the risk of the investment has to be uh, uh, uncovered, you could say. And uh, also that uh, you have to be to use maybe some more standardized frameworks. It's not easy because uh, there's a lot of literature also showing it's not enough to just to give access to, to energy. You need more in order to generate income. But this has to be, uh, I think it has to be uh, assessed as a supplement to energy modeling. So I would really like to see some more methodological development um, about how uh, energy systems based on renewables can, uh, support sustainable development goals because I think that's the only way it will really fly all around the world. And then uh, I think I'll just again mention the issues of stranded assets and, and just transitions. Thank you. This was uh, what I would like to share with you. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsten, uh, for uh... Uh, this nice uh, point of view, um, emphasizing synergies and trade-offs. And um, I think um, that uh, you have mentioned the complexities uh, to tackle these uh, SDGs while uh, sustaining um, uh, physical and uh, technological uh, uh, systems and uh, we will continue the discussion uh, with uh, uh, something that is going to focus more on uh, the question of uh, the shares of renewables increasing in uh, these uh, energy mixes and this is maybe um, the easiest um, question that uh, we can answer using uh, uh, energy system uh, modeling uh, so I will um, now introduce uh, the second speaker, Vincent Mazoric, uh, uh, who is a principal scientist and IP director at Schneider Electric, and uh, who is also involved in uh, the IPCC uh, report as um, 
um, external reviewer. Um, so please, Vincent, um, uh, you have uh, 30 minutes to explain us how, how reconciling reliability and sustainability uh, with some thermodynamics insights dedicated to the integration of renewables in the power system. Mm -hmm. Hello, it's okay? Yeah, perfect, thanks. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Nadia, for the invitation to present this result we uh, we share together with uh, our laboratory. Um, so my uh, presentation would be rather short. Uh, in fact, in uh, four parts, uh, and I'd, I would like to motivate the, these four parts. The first thing is. Uh, in, our, in order to, to model properly uh, uh, <coughs> uh, an energy system and uh, more precisely due to the expected migration toward electricity, a power system, we need to reduce drastically the, the, the description of the different uh, component at different scale in time and in space. Uh, in order to to have a, just the relevant uh, information for for modeling, as previously previously said, but also for operating. And uh, typically, the, we have to consider very various scales in space, for instance, from the the physical point of view, the magnetic domain involved in the conversion of uh, magnetic energy in an electrical machine is typically of uh, one micrometer. And uh, we have to consider at the opposite the grid scale uh, until for uh, continental uh, uh, copper plates uh, of uh, many thousands of kilometers. And in time, we have to consider transient, for instance, from, from the millisecond in case of uh, power application. And uh, we have to consider the planning uh, of the system over one, one century. And uh, so it is therefore impossible to, to adopt a time stepping and uh, uh, a full scale uh, description for, of this system for two reasons. One is uh, this all this information is uh, uh, not available and not useful for decision making. And the second thing is uh, we, we have not enough uh, computing uh, capability for the modeling of such a system. Therefore, we have to reduce uh, the description of the problem. And uh, fortunately, in this, uh, uh, we have a very uh, prolific uh, um, uh, physical uh, uh, description given by thermodynamics, uh, always by thermodynamics, in order to reduce this degree of freedom for any, uh, to describe any macroscopic uh, system. And uh, I will explain how the second principle of thermodynamics provide in the case of power system, the two essential and uh, mandatory constant of motion on which the question of uh, stability and uh, adequacy could be uh, given. And after I will apply on the French case, uh, how this um, this modeling could uh, uh, provide some insight in order to provide some uh, decarbonation pathways in the case of France. So what I have to, to say is that uh, this, this description is quite uh, natural from a thermodynamic point of view, and it's also natural for, for the company uh, for which I work. 
because we are uh, a power uh, apparatus company, so working on mechanics and electricity. And uh, therefore, we have a, a kind of indiscernibility between uh, uh, mechanical and electromagnetic power. And as you probably know already, the two constant of motion describing a power system are one coming from mechanics and the other coming, coming from electromagnetism. So it was quite natural that we, uh, we define uh, and we introduce such a description. Okay, so um, the, basically the, the global plate or an isolated power system could be aggregated from the generation to the end use uh, by, the, by aggregating all the, the grid in what is known as copper plates. And we will describe after the feature, uh, how to feature the, the, the copper plates. And uh, we, we could adopt basically this uh, very ideal uh, description. And if you adopt this description, you, you can consider that the power system is a monotherm thermodynamic machine between uh, generation to end use. And the transmission of the mechanical power basically between the generator and uh, a motor is, uh, is allowed by the excitation of a rotor of typically uh, alternator uh, from which the excitation current uh, of the rotor is, uh, is allowed by the squeezing of some charge uh, 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 squeezed from the earth at the potential V here. And the, the difficulty for the power system uh, compared with other uh, energy system like gas or other commodity like water is that we have the intrication of the control here and how to control the power system and the power flow from which you deliver one end use service and in fact, the control has to, uh, to extract some energy in, uh, from the, the main flow of uh, power in order to uh, allow the, the various operations for reliability of the system. And this is the main difficulty. And uh, in order to to decide and to project in the long term the ability uh, of the system, we have to find a way to decouple and to understand how to decouple this, this interaction, this intrication between power and control. So to do this, we, we adopt uh, from um, the first principle of thermodynamics. We know that uh, it exists um, state function describing this system. So this system is described by four state variables, at least the temperature of the heat tank, the excitation of the rotor, the voltage of the hertz, and the position of the rotor. Of course, the position of the rotor is an angle which is moving as long as the machine is rotating. And uh, the, the, the the very deep meaning of the state function is that if I will produce at infinity uh, this description, I have always the same uh, value for the state function. And uh, I can consider now the small variation of the state functions by this, this derivative. And what is uh, explained by the second principle of thermodynamics is that uh, in order to provide a small variation of the Gibbs free energy, so the, the, the state function is called the Gibbs free energy in, for the, this set of, of state variables. I have to pay a little bit more, at least a little bit more of the uh, Gibbs 
derivatives. In fact, I have to pay a little bit more because I have some losses due to the uh, friction and the Joule losses in the, in the conductors, etc. Et I have many uh, uh, justifications for the, this uh, positive inequality here. And what I, ca I can assume, and what is checked by the electromagnetism, is that the, this variation is always correspond always at any time to the minimization of this uh, gap between the, the power I have to pay for the small variation of the Gibbs free energy. And this is a, a weak reversibility and it's a very striking property uh, from which it is possible to justify first macroscopically the length law the system uh, always fight to, to uh, undergo no modification of its state. So this is a minimization of this derivative here. And locally, from this minimization, you can obtain the, all the Maxwell equation uh, ruling the, any electromagnetic uh, device at least at low frequency, but it is a problem of low frequency. Therefore, we have a, a very aggregated description of the system uh, with a very, uh, so I will, I will not recall all these results because they are uh, at a, a deeper scale of, uh, of the planning. But what is important uh, is that uh, if I extend now the, the domain to the, to the Earth, I have uh, unavailable, un unavailable um, uh, solar radiation. Therefore, I had here the, this radiation to, to, because the system cannot be isolated from solar radiation. And I replace all the machine within the Earth framework. And therefore I introduce the kinetic energy of each rotor and uh, to obtain this uh, conservation equation here, taking into account the, radi the solar radiation and the inertia. And what is interesting is I can uh, analyze the right-hand side has ruling the Faraday's law uh, and uh, all the uh, properties of the uh, electrical machine. And on the left hand side, I have a power balance providing the two energy invariants, the two energy constant of motion from which we can describe any po isolated power system. And as you can see, the two uh, constant of motion are the Gibbs free energy of the system and the, kinetic, the embedded kinetic energy within the machine. This is what we, we, we wanted to, to obtain at the beginning, uh, has a, a discussion uh, to, for further capability of operation of uh, different power systems. Okay, so it's easy now to, by rebalancing the, the conservation equation to discuss basically how the system uh, uh, is operate for a load fluctuation. So imagine I have a switch on a new uh, end use uh, element here by the yellow curve. Uh, of course, the generation is not adapted to this uh, rise in the end use. And because I have a transient, I have extra losses. And therefore only the, the magnetic energy and the kinetic energy can balance at each time the, this equation. But, and by observation of, by monitoring the frequency, uh, it is possible to see the unbalance between supply and demand, and therefore to adjust the generation here. 
Uh, the second part is uh, another uh, possibility where I have a strong short circuit. And in such a case, I have no modification of the demand and no modification on the supply, but I am losing here completely the magnetic energy. And therefore I have no more electrodynamic uh, resistance um, torque on the machine. And therefore I, I need to stop the machine and therefore I have a blackout. So this is the way by which occur any blackout. And of course it's a, a cascading uh, problem. But the question is, uh, my- Sorry, Vincent, just for you to manage your time, you have 15 yes. minutes left uh, maximum. Okay, it's, uh, I think it's correct. Um, if I, I want to detail a little bit more, uh, what is the role of the magnetic energy and the, or the Gibbs free energy and the role on the kinetic energy? Uh, what I could uh, obtain from the previous slide is that uh, the higher the kinetic energy, the longer the time to restore the adequacy between supply and demand. Therefore, my interest is to have this value for the kinetic energy of which the dispatcher could uh, take into account for his decision. And uh, so what happened? Imagine I have, uh, this is a system with two generators and one motor, and it's an uh, it's exact, uh, equivalence is this mechanical system where I have uh, three mass representing the three rotor. Uh, um, describing this circle at 15, 50 Hertz. And uh, this one, the three one, the motor, uh, corresponding to a rise in the end use consumption has an adverse tilt here regarding the two generator here. And if the, the grid, the network, uh, the power grid here is represented here in this mechanical equivalence by these three springs, if these springs here overcome the diameter, in such a case, I lose completely the synchronism between the three masses. And therefore, the, 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 I cannot aggregate all the kinetic energy on the wall of this three mass system. And I can generalize this system to any assembly of rotor and machine by the so-called Kuramoto system. Okay. And one condition, very simple condition, in fact, not this equation, but uh, is to, to keep the synchronism is that the, the, the connectivity of the grid provided by the grid here is large enough compared to the congestion rate of the uh, power system. And therefore I can qualitatively give some uh, disordering factor. So disordering means a desynchronization factor from which I cannot extract the aggregation of the kinetic energy. The first one is a, a uh, very huge uh, injection or consumption point. The second point is uh, a very, uh, very uh, uh, <clears throat> intensive use of the transmission line because the rate of congestion in such a case is rather large and therefore I have to, to provide a, a higher value of the connectivity of the grid. And the last thing is a high frequency. For the high frequency, as you know, the, the impedance of any uh, uh, passive uh, component increase and therefore I have less coupling between the different assets. And the ordering factor, meaning the synchronization factor from which I can uh, leverage the maximum of kinetic energy uh, is uh, to have a copper plate so to uh, multiply the connection between the injection and consumption points, uh, to balance locally at the maximum consumption uh, generation and demand. So this is a 
typical Russian doll grid, and to have a low frequency because low frequency increases the coupling and therefore the synchronism. But what we have to, to keep in mind is that the synchronization of any power system is not in condition and is stable. And therefore, when we imagine just a problem of adequacy, we have to imagine also to discuss the grid on which the system and the asset are uh, placed. Okay, so it is uh, therefore easy to describe what is, uh, how is working the system in a decoupling description. So the first one is to provide synchronism. So the value of synchronism are to restore the problem from a dispatcher uh, keywords, the voltage plan, the reactive power, and the Gibbs free energy for term from thermodynamics. They are speaking of the question, we are all speaking of the question of of the issue of synchronism. And what improves the synchronism is to decrease the congestion rate, to increase the grid conductivity, and to decrease the frequency. And after I have the question, if I have synchronism, I can discuss the transient stability by which I have enough kinetic energy to face to any fluctuation. And therefore here, the, the value is, the key value is the frequency given 50 years uh, in Europe, for instance. And this is the key value uh, given by the T any TSO. And uh, from an energy point of view, this is the kinetic energy with, uh, on which is lying this frequency. But we need the synchronism, of course, to make sense to the frequency. And the, how to increase the frequency, extend the copper plates, uh, favor huge, huge, huge moving mass in any machine. So if you have no machine, it's complicated to have kinetic energy and uh, increase the frequency. And at the end, by superposing these two quality, we can consider the active flow of exchange between generation and use, and therefore to discuss how to provide any energy service. Okay, so what is at uh, the trend? So I, I, I restore the second principle of thermodynamics and uh, I give a, a value at any term here. So the, the, red, the yellow term here is given by, for flexibility because it involves the solar as previously introduced, but also the wind, the storage and the, the demand side management. We have here the mechanical power uh, the classical mechanical power of the uh, conventional generation. And here we have our two uh, uh, energy uh, constant of motion. And uh, in fact, under the sustainable development goals, and where we consider that uh, we have to uh, decarbonize uh, the conventional asset, except for hydro, we have to do expect uh, uh, decreasing of the uh, mechanical power here, decreasing of the kinetic energy on, and the variation of the kinetic energy too. And uh, the question of uh, Gibbs free energy is uh, questionable because we can replace the high one by uh, capacitance and also by a better coupling of the grid. So it's this, this is an open issue. And uh, the, the change from an, hard, uh, an hardware point of view is uh, the introduction of grid tie inverter in order to introduce energy assets, but grid tie in, are not, inverter are not enough in order to discuss the stability issue. We need a grid former inverter, which can uh, introduce power and energy at each a variation of the stability condition. And as an introduction to the next presentation, this, uh, in fact, we, 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 are, we are moving from a, a stock given, given, given by the primary energy to a stock provided by the functional material for the, the infrastructure because we expect for these different uh, uh, 
category of infrastructure, of component of the new infrastructure, uh, a rise of this kind of materials, even for couplings, because the, the, the synchronism today provided by the transmission grid will be in the future provided by the distribution grid and therefore it will be a very dense grid with uh, uh, expecting a <laughs> huge amount of copper or, or, or other conductors. Okay, what I have to, to just to introduce is that the question of adequacy, which is uh, the the, the main point discussed in the, in the transformation of the power system is not, uh, sh should be uh, faced to these two constant of motion. And basically what we have to consider is uh, the, how the flexibilities are bounded uh, by, uh, their energy footprint in order to manage them. And basically the space complexity of all the assets and the time agility, because if we reduce the kinetic energy, we have to increase the capability to, to decide quickly how to, uh, to keep the adequacy between supply and demand. And therefore today we are here. We can consider that the mix point could be moved more uh, to the left, but not, not to zero, because the real time in the power system never exists due to the light of uh, the velocity of the light. Okay, so now I have some results obtained on France to give. Uh, um, uh, less than five minutes left. Huh? Okay, so I have two, just two, two different slides. So these results are, were obtained by uh, Gondia and uh, Raphael Clouet and many others before for their contribution and are obtained mainly by under times FR uh, modeling. And uh, what is, uh, I have just two, two slides uh, uh, to introduce the kind of result uh, obtained within this modeling is that if we consider now the the possibility of 100% uh, uh, renewable power system for France. Uh, first of all, due to the air intermittency and the, the, the decommissioning of a huge mass in the uh, renewable energy system, we have to constrain the power system in order to be sure we keep enough inertia for the operation of the system. So this is the curve of the without reliability constraint. And in such a case, the system cannot be uh, operate because we have no, uh, no more inertia in the system and under constraint, of course, and the constraint is given by the, the calibrating here, uh, 2008, uh, 30 seconds. And we keep this property uh, we need to, to constrain the problem in order to have enough inertia. And if the system is constrained by its inertia, in the migration for 40% of renewable to 100% of renewable gives this, this, energy, this, this uh, energy generation per year until 2050. And from the, it is possib possible to, to, to place on the space of the French territory, the various assets from which uh, this generation could be obtained. And uh, so I just uh, plot the, diff the various uh, uh, generation per, per region, so 13 regions in France. And as you can uh, check that the, the generation is more uniform uh, in case of completely renewable system. And in such a case, the rate of congestion is decreasing. And if the rate of congestion is decreasing, 
the synchronism indicator in, in, is improved from one to uh, two and sometimes five uh, for this situation. At the opposite, for a conventional power system, uh, we have a concentration of the conventional asset, typically nuclear for France in red, and the synchronism indicator is decreased. And therefore, if we want to keep the same quality of uh, synchronization in order to aggregate the kinetic energy provided by the uh, nuclear asset, we need to reinforce the transmission grid at the horizon 2050. So this is a compilation of these results and uh, from uh, today to, to 2050. And therefore, you can see that uh, the kinetic energy is always decreasing uh, for renewable scenario, whereas the synchronism indicator is increased for renewable scenario. Therefore, we, uh, we have to find a trade-off between them. Also, uh, so I have not enough time to discuss this, but uh, the- yeah, so the don't discuss it, <laughs> sorry. Okay, <laughs> so after I have just the conclusion, but the question yeah. is, uh, is the French, uh, is the French uh, territory is the right uh, size of modeling? And uh, in fact, uh, we we had in the previous results that we transfer uh, we we are ex we export power uh, electricity outside and in a completely renewable we import power, and uh, in such a case we can see that if any region want to uh, to be autonomous in renewable. Uh, generation in such a case we had another investment to operate and uh, it not it not make a full sense because the ancillary service meaning the the quality for synchronism and uh, and inertia are not uh, provided for all these regions so it's just an adequacy uh, equilibrium but not an operational uh, result. So, as a conclusion, uh, the first one is uh, thermodynamics provide a natural and very efficient framework to derive an aggregated representation of the dynamic system. And uh, I think we have uh, just to discuss two aggregated uh, uh, energy, which are scalar and very uh, 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 convenient to discuss. Okay, but uh, as a result, the first one is the grid synchronism is a critical issue to correctly aggregate the kinetic energy. And uh, this issue is always uh, omitted in the discussion. Uh, the, we have uh, two uh, mitigated uh, results. The first one uh, uh, so, is that centralized system favor stability, but uh, geoparadise synchronism, and uh, conversely, uh, fully decentralized system, geoparadise inertia, but are very good for synchronism, but have not enough en uh, kinetic energy to, to aggregate. So we have probably to find a, a, a trade-off between them. But what is, uh, the, therefore, the, the one transformation under action today is that to adopt from a very uh, pyramidal uh, uh, umbrella grid, a transformation to a Russian doll uh, with a cluster uh, grid. And this is, justified by these two pro previous properties. Uh, what I have to say also uh, about the limitation of the French exercise is that uh, uh, we need conventional flexible plants like biomass, which are functioning in extreme peak and the value of biomass sometimes is questionable from the uh, discussion of carbon neutrality. Sorry, Vincent, uh, I have to interrupt you, and I think we will uh, go back to your slide of conclusion, and um, it's going to be available for uh, everybody because I don't want to 
um, uh, reduce the time for the next speaker. Um, okay. So I would like to thank you. And I think we've been uh, uh, deeply embedded in uh, another kind of uh, trade-off, a technical one that you have um, presented us um, in order to sustain the operation of the power system. Uh, and I, now I would like to, um, to uh, introduce uh, Gondia uh, Soka Snek, uh, who is going uh, to talk about uh, externalities. Uh, Gondia Soka Snek is uh, a senior uh, energy specialist, uh, modeling and analysis of energy system. Uh, he will speak <coughs> about the um, um, project. Uh, that has um, been uh, conducted in the framework of uh, uh, Institut Français pour les Energies Nouvelles. And the title of his presentation is Raw Materials with a High Share of Low Carbon Energy Technologies for the Energy Transition. Um, so please, uh, Gondia, and maybe Vincent, if you can uh, quit the uh, share and let Gondia share his slides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, so uh, I will just uh, could you see could you see my screen, please? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Thank you. So hello, everyone. So um, I represent our work uh, with. Uh, Emmanuel Ash uh, on raw material criticality with a high share of low carbon energy technologies for the, the energy transition. So, um, okay. So um, this work uh, as uh, stated by Nadia is part of the GENERATE project, uh, which uh, received the uh, financial uh, support of the French National Research Agency. Its objective is to analyze um, the geopolitical consequences of uh, rapid uh, global development of low carbon energy innovation. It is uh, subdivided in three parts. So um, analyzing the criticality of raw materials such as uh, lithium, cobalt, nickel, uh, copper, rare earth, uh, aluminum, uh, zinc, and um, uh, using um, using the, um, the integrated assessment model TIAM. Um, uh, the second and third point uh, are related to the studies of uh, the new geography of patents for the REDS and uh, the development uh, model of oil producing countries. So uh, for this uh, for this uh, presentation, I will just uh, focus on the first point: uh, how to implement. Uh, uh, raw material in uh, in the CHAM model. So, um, uh, if you want uh, to have more details, uh, you can follow this link uh, on ResearchGate, the project uh, generate project. Uh, so, uh, as introduction, so um, uh, as you know, multiple uh, future trajectories have been analyzed in order to to achieve uh, a low carbon energy transition. So uh, technology is generally considered uh, to play a central role, uh, but large uh, uncertainties uh, remain about the widespread uh, diffusion of uh, low carbon uh, uh, innovation. And uh, what is given as a certainty with all uh, decarbonization uh, innovations uh, is the uh, increasing need for oil and refined uh, metals. So indeed, uh, many researchers uh, consider that uh, the current available uh, material uh, resources would uh, um, uh, certainly not be sufficient in a future uh, driven by uh, stringent environmental uh, constraint and economic uh, growth. So these multiple uh, future pathways uh, for global energy uh, uh, through to 2050 with existing policies and uh, announced uh, intentions around the world raise two questions. How can this fast shift 
uh, impact uh, material resource of IBTs. And uh, would future possible constraint on supply of uh, materials uh, impede uh, this uh, energy transition? Uh, as a heterogeneous field of uh, research, raw materials uh, supply risk and culturality have been widely discussed uh, since the past decade, as you can see in the two graphs below. Uh, since 2000, more than 2000 uh, articles have been published on the issue of material criticality. And uh, we can pinpoint the fact that nearly 80% of, uh, of which uh, since uh, 2010. So uh, knowing and quantifying uh, the implication of foresight energy scenarios uh, on uh, raw material resources will be valuable in order to shape the future uh, with, uh, with more efficient uh, resource uh, management and uh, long-term uh, energy analysis without uh, taking into account the adequate available uh, resource supplies could be irrelevant or might need uh, to, to be reassessed in, uh, in, uh, in response to um, uh, to to new resource uh, supply constraints. Hello. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, a linkage. Uh, okay, it's not for me. Uh, a linkage uh, between uh, raw material um, supply chain and uh, prospective uh, energy models has to be uh considered by energy models uh, and uh, policymakers so uh right now we 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 found uh uh four four approaches in the scientific literature and uh, using long-term uh, energy models uh is currently dominating the scientific literature and can be subdivided into uh two main uh strands of approach as you can see here uh, so the first approach is using uh, the outputs of uh, long-term energy model as inputs into life cycle assessment uh, analysis. So, for example, I just choose uh, three, three or four examples right now. For example, at the world level, we have uh, uh, the, um, this, uh, this article uh, in 2019, and also I can uh, even uh, consider as well uh, the recent uh, uh, the recent uh, release of, uh, of uh, the IEA report of, uh, on the role of critical materials. Uh, at the regional level, we have also, we have different uh, geographical uh, scale. And uh, for the second approach, um, uh, and, and we have an end, where we have a, an endogenous uh, integration of uh, raw material supply chain as uh, additional constraints in foresight uh, energy system uh, models. So uh, what we, we found in the literature is that uh, most of the studies uh, using this approach uh, were top-down uh, models, focusing more on rare off uh, elements and considering environmental uh, aspects. So generated, generate, uh, the generate project, um, Contribute uh, by filling the gap uh, identified in the in the scientific literature on the energy system optimization models by implementing uh, raw uh, material supply and um, demand uh, end uses in the bottom up integrated assessment model. So uh, for this. Uh, this is the second part. We will uh, discuss how it has been uh, implemented uh, in uh, the CHAM model. So, uh, as you already know, so in our uh, CHAM uh, model, uh, we, which, which is uh, subdivided into 16 regions, uh, we, we use uh, this, uh, the, the CHAM uh, times integrated assessment model. Uh, to analyze inter interactions uh, between a low carbon uh, energy transition and uh, raw material criticality, such as, uh, for example, the assessment of uh, future risk uh, related to uh, lithium uh, supply chains, the dynamic uh, criticality of uh, copper, rare earth elements, cobalt, nickel. Uh, we have enriched, uh, the, for example, the, the model with uh, different batteries. Uh, 
for EVs. So for this presentation, I will just focus on two or three uh, materials and how we, we did it. So uh, for example, uh, here, uh, when we are representing uh, the, the different raw material, we, we are representing them from the resources till the end uses. Uh, so for example, if I'm taking the example of the lithium, uh, we define, we identified the three, um, the different types of resources, mainly, for example, the two conventional uh, deposits. So uh, the um, brine from salas uh, and uh, the lithium bearing uh, rock, uh, spodumen, and also the unconventional uh, deposit. So we are representing all the processes uh, until the, the refined uh, product uh, for the end uses. So uh, between them, uh, we are having uh, the possibility to trade, uh, for example, some uh, intermediate uh, uh, product uh, to take into account, for example, the regional uh, specificities. For example, uh, mm, uh, we do not have uh, resources in South Korea or Japan, but we have, uh, for example, the refined uh, uh, production line in, uh, in this uh, region. So this trade uh, for intermediate uh, product will uh, will allow us to follow how we evolve uh, all the demand and uh, the domestic and export uh, flows uh, between uh, the region uh, uh, till um, 2050. So we define also, we have two types of uh, uh, demand. So we have, uh, for example, uh, and um, for the transport, the mobility, the mobility demand will uh, allow us to to, to, to obtain the, um, the, the result of well, the consumption of uh, raw materials. And for the, for example, uh, we, have, uh, we have defined uh, exogenously the evolution of the demand for the sectors in pink, for example, uh, as we can see as well in copper. So uh, we, are, we also implemented uh, the, um, uh, the, the human uh, mining we see it later and uh, the recycling, uh, uh, the end of, uh, end of life recycling rate, at least to be, to be able to take into account the urban mining and uh, the evolution of uh, the secondary uh, uh, production. So as you can see uh, as well uh, in copper, we have the same uh, paradigm. So uh, we are starting from the resources to the end uses. And, um, this uh, this uh, different uh, possibility of uh, representation will uh, allow us to to assess the evolution of uh, material consumption uh, with regard to the deployment of uh, low carbon technologies uh, to assess the trade and uh, afterwards to analyze the different uh, uh, geological geopolitical and environmental risk so mainly geological and uh, geological and geopolitical uh, risk so here, for example, uh, in the copper, for example, the evolution of the power sector or the transport, uh, the road transport sector uh, are endogenous. Uh, so the, uh, and we will be able to, to access uh, the evolution of this uh, material consumption. So as I said, uh, for example, uh, we are implementing the material content. So uh, here, for example, in the case of copper, I will just show two examples, copper and cobalt, for example. Uh, for copper uh, from uh, literature, we have this, uh, this copper content, so the minimum and the maximum we reference. And uh, in, uh, in the, our scenarios, we are using this, uh, um, this copper content for, uh, for uh, power plants and as well for this, all these different power plants. And as well uh, in road transport, we have these uh, uh, subdivisions uh, and uh, uh, copper content. In the same uh, in the same way we we did uh, for uh, cobalt uh, for the cobalt contain uh, for different uh, cathode chemistry uh, types so NCA uh, uh, NMC uh, and uh, LFP and uh, uh, we choose uh, some uh, we define different size of uh, battery we 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 obtain from another project uh, which has been done uh, in. Uh, uh, at IFPN for the ADEM. So uh, we also, to be able to take into account the recycling uh, uh, 
line and uh, the urban mine, etc. For example, in the case of copper, we define, uh, we implemented the end of life recycling rate for all end use we considered uh, in the model. And also uh, we define a mean average lifetime at least to be able to consider, the, to take into account the, the aspect of uh, urban mining. Uh, for the cobalt as well, we implemented the end of life uh, recycling rate and also the average uh, lifetime, at least to, to have uh, the evolution of, uh, uh, of uh, the impact of uh, the recycling, uh, of recycling in, uh, in the demand uh, um, in our result. So, uh, well, for this purpose, we um, uh, we run four scenarios, so two climate scenarios, so four degrees and two degrees, and uh, for each uh, climate scenarios, uh, we 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 did uh, according to uh, to, uh, to the material we are analyzing uh, two um, mobility uh, shapes, so a business as usual uh, mobility and a sustainable mobility. We we uh, we derived from the IEA mobility uh, mobile uh, model, sorry, MOMO. Uh, so here it means that uh, for the, the business as usual mobility, uh, we are assuming a continuous increase of uh, the ownership rate and a higher car dependency. And uh, in the sustainable mobility, we are giving uh, more priorities uh, to uh, sustainable uh, modes of uh, mobility, such as the public on and non-motorized uh, transport. So as you can see here, for example, if I'm taking this example uh, in short distance, uh, we have the evolution of the mobility. Uh, so we can see here, for example, uh, for uh, uh, what I could show in, in, it's better to see it in a long distance. For example, here we can see the evolution of big cars and they are all reducing due to, uh, to a shift to, to, to public and non-motorized uh, transport. And we are here, for example, uh, we are seeing more mobility, for example, for buses. And here it was lesser uh, in a BI uh, uh, mobility. So uh, in terms of result, uh, uh, we, we derived uh, the evolution of the, the global vehicle stock uh, between uh, 20, 05 to 2050, and um, we can see the evolution, for example, and the impact of uh, the climate uh, targets or um, uh, the mobility shift. So, for example, if you are taking these two part in the same scenario, in the four degree scenario, the impact of sustainable uh, mobility uh, will allow us to have uh, 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 more than 800 million vehicles less um uh, uh, by 2050 and uh, with the climate uh, uh, comparing the 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 i would say the rightmost uh, bars and uh, these uh, middle uh, bars um uh, for example the four degrees in BAU uh, in the BAU uh, mobility and the two degrees in BAU uh, mobility we can see the, the evolution of the penetration of uh, electric vehicles in the global uh, vehicle stock. So um, you can see, uh, for example, around one third of uh, world fleet uh, will be uh, two free wheelers uh, due to the, the specificity we add uh, mostly in uh, China and uh, India. And uh, um, the EV fleet is, most, is mostly uh, located in Asian uh, countries. So, we compare it to, for example, to other result uh, we can uh, we can see in the, uh, when we did uh, this uh, this analysis. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, in comparison with the IEA Jevo uh, 2019, uh, where when we were, when we finished uh, the, this anal uh, this uh, result, we are uh, more or less uh, the same uh, on the same line. Uh, for the, the evolution of the global power uh, installed capacity uh, as well, we can see the shift between, uh, so on the left, we have the evolution of the installed capacity and the, on the right, you can see the evolution of the electricity production. So you, we, we have uh, the evolution of, uh, we can see uh, uh, the evolution of the renewables uh, penetration in power, the power system. 
And uh, at the end, uh, we will be able to analyze uh, well, uh, and eventually the, the evolution of uh, the demand according to the resources we already implemented in the, as a constraint in the in the model. So to I will not uh, spend more time on this, and I will go directly to the to the to the, to the result. So uh, in this slide. Uh, uh, the two rightmost, uh, we are we 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 derive the result uh, corresponding to the primary the evolution of the cumulative primary copper consumption. So uh, in this slide, uh, the two rightmost uh, bars depict uh, total cumulative uh, here uh, the total cumulative uh, copper extracted from mines between uh, 2010 and 2050. And the two leftmost uh, bars represent the global identified uh, copper resources in 2010, and uh, the global um, the global uh, uh, identified uh, resources uh, um, plus the estimated undiscovered uh, copper resources at 90 percent chance assessed in 2013 by uh, USGS. So um, uh, on the right axis, we have defined an, uh, an indicator uh, to assess the copper criticality, which is here. It is uh, calculated as a ratio of uh, cumulative copper extracted to the, to the resources. And uh, we can say that, uh, for example, uh, here in this case, 78.3% uh, and 90 uh, 89.4 percent of uh, the total identified uh, copper resources will be extracted in the four degrees and the, uh, the two degrees uh, uh, when compared to uh, to these uh, resources. Uh, these uh, criticalities uh, will fall to 47 percent and 53.7 uh, percent. Uh, if the undiscovered uh, uh, copper resources are assumed uh, by the uh, assumed by the ISGS, uh, USGS are also available. So, um, in uh, in term of uh, of uh, comparison, so it means that uh, between 2010 2050, we are extracting uh, around 1,600 uh, million ton of uh, of copper. While it will be, it will reach uh, one thousand nine hundred million ton in uh, in the two degrees, uh, if you are considering an average recycling rate uh, of forty five percent. Even we already, did, uh, it's just an average. But uh, we, as we I, I presented before, we define for each end use uh, the the level of uh, recycling rate. So in comparison to other recent uh, publication on uh, copper, for example, we are. Reaching 800, 1,000 million ton of copper cumulatively, uh, in cumulative uh, uh, perspective, uh, considering 70% and 90% of uh, of recycling rate, um, and uh, in uh, this, uh, in another article, for example, of, from uh, Eshkaki, uh, they are reaching uh, more or less the same uh, value uh, as we obtain uh, with the uh, Cham. Um, uh, model. In a, in another perspective, uh, at the consumption side, uh, we considering the previous graph we just uh, saw. Uh, here we are presenting uh, the evolution of the cumulative the, the cumulative copper demand. Uh, so uh, we are having the same uh, graph. So the the identified uh, resources uh, here the cumulative. Uh, Copper demand and uh, the the indicator we use here it's uh, the cumulative copper uh, consumed uh, uh, to the, the ratio between uh, the copper uh, the cumulative copper consumed uh, to resources, the resources. So uh, it shows the importance of uh, the the secondary uh, production in the copper demand. Uh, it uh, uh, why that's why we wanted to present uh, this uh, graph, it's just because uh, it points us uh, that uh, without any secondary uh, uh, production, uh, the total cumulative uh, copper uh, consumption will have been uh, 100 
19 uh, percent uh, of uh, of the world known uh, resources in the four degrees while you should uh, 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 reach 130 31 uh, percent uh, in the two degrees uh, scenario so uh, comparing both uh, graphs uh, graphs we can uh, retrieve for example the 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 amount of uh, the secondary uh, uh, production uh, uh, in cumulative uh, perspective uh, between 2010 and 2050. Uh, also, uh, I uh, we can see uh, at the bottom um, uh, two uh, two bullet points to 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 highlight uh, the 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 higher the highest uh, consumer. Uh, uh, of uh, copper and uh, producer. So we can see that, for example, China, Western Europe, uh, Japan, and the United States of, uh, and USA represent uh, almost uh, more than uh, around uh, two thirds of uh, total cumulative uh, copper consumption. While uh, for at uh, the production side, uh, we are having uh, uh, only, for example, just uh, Central and South uh, America, of course, uh, Chile. And Peru, uh, uh, China, our developing Asian countries will uh, represent more than fifty percent of the total cumulative uh, copper mine. So, uh, in terms of uh, the evolution of um, of yearly uh, copper consumption, we can see uh, that we are reaching uh, around one hundred million ton of uh, per year by twenty fifty. Uh, in a, in a two degrees, why it will be uh, eighty six uh, around eighty six uh, million ton in uh, four degrees. Um, in terms of uh, per capita, we are reaching uh, we are doubling uh, between uh, twenty uh, twenty fifty between twenty twenty and twenty fifty in terms of uh, values, uh, comparing to other uh, uh, result uh, using. Uh, other uh, approaches, uh, we can see that, uh, for example, uh, the result from uh, the main scenario of uh, Vidal, uh, it's reaching uh, 45 uh, million ton, while comparing to the Halada one, uh, the Halada scenario, where they are just considering 10 countries, uh, BRICS and uh, G6, uh, they, they are already reaching 45 million ton. So we can see uh, how it could be uh, very broad, uh, the evolution of the, um, the result. And uh, for example, in terms of uh, demand, we are more aligned with, uh, still uh, in line with uh, cheaper and uh, uh, even we are not using the same uh, approaches. Uh, so uh, we also wanted to present, uh, for example, the impact of uh, the sustainable uh, mobility, for example, uh, in the case of copper, uh, of the copper demand. So in uh, in the left, uh, um, in, uh, here we can see uh, the, the evolution of the copper consumption, uh, the yearly copper consumption uh, divided by sector. And uh, we can see here uh, in yellow the part of the transport, the road transport uh, sector. Uh, and we can see uh, in green uh, the total, uh, the arrow in green uh, represents the total copper consumption of the road transport. Uh, we are still in, uh, we just uh, consider the business as usual uh, mobility here. And in red, when, comp when uh, implementing uh, the mobility shift, we are seeing a decrease, we can see here with a dot uh, uh, below. Uh, uh, and uh, we, are, we, we represent it here to have more details by region. For example, the the, the, um, the level of uh, copper consumption uh, avoided uh, in each region. For example, we can see at the world level it's only it's two percent, but uh, at the level of the consumption, it's uh, we we assume it's uh, it's a lot uh, comparing its uh, its cumulative uh, copper consumption uh, between 2010 and 2050. Uh, if you are considering, for example, uh, per region, we can see uh, Africa it's, uh, is reaching uh, due to the mobility shift to 18% uh, uh, to 19%. Uh, and uh, if you are considering, for example, some uh, 
other countries such as China, it's around 2%. But if we are in comparison with uh, the level of, the, uh, of its demand, uh, 2%, uh, we are considering it's, uh, it could, it's a huge value to, to consider and to, to put it in perspective with uh, uh, what we are seeing uh, as the evolution of uh, copper consumption. So uh, after showing some uh, result uh, of uh, copper, uh, we wanted to show as well uh, for the cobalt case. Uh, in the term of cobalt case, for example, here. Sorry, uh, uh, Gondia, you have uh, also reached almost your time. So if you can just accelerate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then we we'll can have a little time before okay. six to discuss. Okay, perfect. Uh, so here, uh, we, um, in terms of uh, criticality for the cobalt uh, demand, we are reaching around eight, uh, 83 uh, percent of uh, of criticality in uh, two degrees uh, with uh, with usual mobility, and uh, why it will be uh, 64 percent uh, in uh, in a four degrees scenario. So. Um, when uh, implementing uh, the different evolution of uh, batteries, for example, uh, we consider three scenarios. So uh, high cobalt, where we are we are having more lithium ion uh, batteries, uh, such as uh, NMC622. And uh, in uh, central uh, cobalt, we are having a mix of uh, uh, high cobalt uh, content uh, batteries, such as uh, 622 and uh, low uh, cobalt contain um, um, uh, such as uh, NMC811. So when we are doing this, uh, this we are implementing this uh, constraint in, uh, in, the, in the penetration of uh, future EVs uh, in the global, uh, uh, in the stock uh, of uh, the CHAM model, we are, uh, have, we are decreasing, for example, the the criticality of uh, cobalt demand from 83% to 65%. So we are gaining 20% uh, just by passing from uh, uh, a mix of 10% NCA and 90% uh, uh, NMC uh, 62. Well, uh, just to precise, the NNCA, it's uh, a battery which is uh, more used uh, for uh, in the Tesla uh, uh, EVs. Um, uh, for the lithium, uh, at the same uh, in the same way, uh, we define uh, contrary to what we are hearing, uh, we do not have a geological uh, uh, criticality for lithium. Uh, when we are checking the value, we are we have below fifty percent of the uh, of the resources uh, which will be uh, extracted uh, between uh, now and. Uh, 2050, and um, uh, we we uh, we can we we can say that we we identified uh, different uh, uh, many um, other um, uh, how can I call it uh, our risk uh, related to uh, for example to to environment and uh, to to the national uh, strategies. So uh, 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 according, uh, in the lithium uh, triangle uh, 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 for, um, for, the, for the future. So um, for the bauxite as well, uh, we, are, we are reaching 87% of, uh, of uh, criticality um, uh, in the two degrees, why it will be just uh, 34 Four percent in uh, in the four degrees, so we are multiplying almost by uh, by two point five uh, the cumulative uh, uh, consumption. So, in conclusion, uh, this is a table uh, in a nutshell to 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 put uh, all the result uh, of uh, of the criticality we obtain uh, considering the business as usual mobility. And uh, we are seeing that uh, copper are reaching, is reaching an, an 89.4 percent, while in, for example, for rare earth, we are only 3.8 percent uh, in the two degrees. Uh, of course, it's a uh, rare earth considered as one and not uh, a subdivision of uh, the 17 uh, uh, 
uh, uh, rare earth elements. Uh, of course, if you are subdivided uh, by each element, we will we'll, uh, face uh, different uh, level of uh, criticalities. Uh, so as I uh, just mentioned, uh, we we identified other different form of vulnerability. For example, in the in the case of uh, of lithium, for example. Uh, uncertainties of, about the, the evolution of the market uh, to to meet the new uh, uh, the, the evolution, new uh, demand on time, and uh, also the different uh, the uncertainties on uh, the strategy of large con of, of large uh, consumers, and also the uh, the national. Uh, 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 the consequences of national uh, strategies, for example, in the lithium uh, triangle. So in Chile, we've uh, almost uh, uh, free cattle of uh, regional uh, pro uh, production. Um, deposit concession, uh, concession uh, holders are subject to exploitation uh, quotas and uh, short-term leasing uh, contract. Uh, contrary in Argentina, uh, it's uh, it depends on the um, on the on the on the uh, on the national, uh, it it depends on the uh, I I would say it depends on the evolution of the political change uh, in the country, and uh, in Bolivia they are not producing uh, for the moment, and despite having the second uh, largest uh, lithium uh, resources in the world, so uh, because uh, the government wanted to 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 be they were in favor of. Uh, having a vertical integration of uh, local uh, industry to position themselves uh, along the entire uh, industrial uh, value chain. And also the environmental impact, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in South America, uh, due to the production of lithium or uh, our, um, our raw materials. And uh, the last point I will uh, raise is uh, the, the possibility to implement some uh, public policies with can be very uh, useful uh, in terms of evolution of uh, the raw material criticality in, uh, uh, with uh, the, the different changes we are expecting in the, with uh, the energy transition. So I will uh, stop here and uh, we can discuss uh, according to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gonzia, and uh, thank you for um... Uh, this um, talk, uh, we see that uh, the two SDGs that we wanted to tackle today mean uh, the seven and the elevens about uh, affordable and clean energy and sustainable cities and communities is quite uh, complex to introduce in the framework of uh, our modeling approach. So I would like uh, the, the three speakers please to open their um, camera and then uh, we will um, have a short uh, discussion. Um, I will go back to uh, Kirsten and uh, the questions um, related to your um, talk, Kirsten. Uh, so first we had uh, Guillaume Martin uh, from uh, CEA in France, head, head of laboratory. And uh, he said um, uh, that he was uh, wondering how to avoid greenwashing operations with this model, so I don't remember which one he was referring to, maybe you know, uh, he was thinking about the fact that gas uh, was included in the next EU green taxonomy, uh, along with nuclear, I think. Uh, so do you see what he's referring to, Kirsten? Uh, thank you for that question. I don't think that this is an issue specifically for one of the models. But of course, what they can do in the models and what can be done in all these uh, energy models and the integrated assessment models is also like we saw in the last presentation to have a portfolio or uh, selections in the scenarios for which uh, technologies you would like to use. And uh, we know that uh, one of the key conclusions would be when you would uh, go for zero net zero emissions and also how long you can go on with the gas, the coal and, and the oil, of course. So I think this discussion about the gas is um, natural gas is very 
related to the stabilization scenarios and when we will go for net zero. And that will be one of the very interesting issues in relation to the IPC report. One concern I have with the natural gas is that um, if we invest in a lot of uh, guy, uh, gas power plants or um, uh, pipes systems, then uh, they will have a long lifetime, you know, 30 years or more. So in that way, um, if we're talking about net zero and phasing out fossil fuels around 2050, then uh, there are some issues on whether we should invest in natural gas right now. Okay, and um, he was following by another question. Um, he said, I have understood from your presentation that health issues are modeled with respect to pollution essentially, but what about the risk of electricity network failure? Um, network failure was that if the people were damaged by some uh, accidents from the, I don't think that the models include that, but uh, it, it, it could be done if, if people would do that, but uh, maybe uh, the other speakers know about that. Well, yeah, I think we can ask Vincent maybe to answer that because that was the purpose. Yeah, of his, it's, it's uh, closer to what he's dealing with. Yeah, to what he did. So Vincent, can you just uh, react to that? And maybe uh, finish uh, the conclusions that you wanted to make about your uh, talk. First on the conclusion not I have no more to say, except that probably we 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 were focused on uh, first on the adequacy, secondly to the condition of operation. But uh, we have now to take into account the externalities in the modeling. Uh, the first one, uh, very obvious after the Gondias presentation, uh, is to introduce the functional materials. And the other one, if we reduce uh, the constant of motion I introduced my, in my presentation, we, we have probably to expect more agility to operate the system and therefore the IT consumption in order to, to, to manage the power system and the asset portfolio and demand side management, we have to introduce the self-consumption operated by the control uh, and the digitalization of the energy system. So I think the, we have to enlarge and to endogenize these two externalities. Uh, so this, I don't remember. The... Yeah, so the question, in fact, of uh, Guillaume Martin, I think uh, your uh, talk uh, completely answered it because uh, he was wondering if um, the risk of electricity network failure was taken into account uh, in some models. Um, so besides the health issues uh, that are the consequences of uh, these failures, uh, so do you have any insight into this? Uh, I don't know what is a failure or if it's a larger uh... Uh, accident uh, of nuclear plant, uh, I think it's not uh, taken into he was, account. He it was uh, referring to the, for instance, the numerous deaths attributed to this kind of event in the US recently. I have no, uh, no element on this. Uh, An electricity uh, network is... failure is just like uh, what you described, I think. Yes, okay, yeah. For, but the consequences and the financial consequences, I don't know. If uh, even if what I introduced at the beginning, the, the power system is more brittle because the control we have not, uh, uh, we have a very intricate system between the control and power flow. And for other commodity, we can decouple and therefore we, it's easy to, to know what is the share of electricity uh, and what is the share of the commodity. And uh, but for power system, it's difficult to to imagine the the consequences. Except that I think uh, uh, we can uh, have some um, insight from the the cost of the investment uh, investment in the um, uh, UPS 
which uh, perform some uh, uh, redundancy until 97% of the uh, overconsumption in order to be sure that we have no uh, interruption in the in the elect in the power system for very dedicated application. Okay, thank you. I would like uh, to go uh, to Gontia, and we have a question of uh, Louis Godon uh, from Vito. Um, he said, could we integrate additional externalities that may occur along the material supply chain, like water, land, pollution, ocean, acidification, etc.? Um, well, uh, for, for example, for rare earth, we implement it for water, the water needed to produce, uh, for example, one kilo or rare, of rare earth, for example, we implement it. So at least uh, at the end to compare it with uh, what we know right now as a level of consumption, for example, in industry, uh, in, um, for example, in, the, uh, in a region like uh, Australia. But uh, after that, uh, for land pollution and ocean acidification, it's more related to life cycle assessment. So it's uh, maybe another aspect, another aspect uh, to, to analyze. Okay. Um, I will try to, to um, uh, synthesize the question of Marc Daras and uh, in fact, uh, I think he's uh, referring to, and this is a question for uh, you three, uh, to the fact that um, in uh, the models, uh, the organization of the society is kind of already embedded, um, mainly in the drivers that we have for the models, for instance, um, that uh, relates to the growth uh, uh, usually, uh, especially for uh, economical uh, based uh, models. And um, he, um, he asks how we can, uh, we can question the dependency that we have to energy uh, in this uh, techno economical representation. Uh, I don't know if uh, I, made, I made it clear. So if someone has the point, <laughs> please. I, I can say something because one of the models uh, that I presented, the integrated assessment models, actually, as I said, had a lot of assumptions about um, also lifestyles and also saturation sort of levels of how much you should consume in different parts of the world and also international financial transfers. So. Uh, and, and this is a nature paper. So that is all, that is actually work done on this where you are trying to, uh, to reconsider what the demand level should be and what the economic structure would be. And uh, I would also say that one major IPCC conclusion would be that uh, if you want to achieve, for example, 1.5 degrees, you have to make a, what they call a fundamental change. I think fundamental change is pretty blah, blah, broad, but big changes also in the economic structure and, and so forth. So, uh, so this is something that uh, is dealt with in some of the, the models. But I would say it's not integrated in the model. I will more see it as a, as a separate discussing driving different scenarios. Mm. Um, for you, Gonzia, uh, specific uh, technical questions from uh, Evangelos Panos uh, from PSI. Uh, he said, first, could you elaborate how do you model recycling? Oh, okay. Uh, for recycling, uh, we, um, we define uh, 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 the, we use the recycling rate uh to uh, to with um, different indicators of uh, the time uh, variables uh we implemented uh in order to obtain at the end of the lifetime to have a, a certain amount of recycling so uh, we we have the technology uh, with the evolution and uh, when it's, uh, we have a new capacity, uh, new installed capacity, 
uh, at the end of the life, uh, they, we could uh, reuse a certain amount. So we've, uh, that's why we are using the end of life uh, recycling rate. And after that, to be able to take into account the urban mining, what we do, it's just, for example, to make it dynamic. It means that, for example, what we have uh, before the first year of, uh, of, uh, of the model, uh, we can calculate because we have the evolution of the stock of, uh, of uh, copper consumed in each of these of this, uh, NEUs. And then we will be able to, 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 to have the evolution of the urban mining between 2010 to 2050, which means that uh, taking into account the evolution of the lifetime. So for example, for some uh, uh, end use like uh, building, for example, where we are having 40, uh, 40 50 years uh, lifetime, uh, we will be able to see according to the evolution of each stock, what will be the evolution uh, of the, the potential of, uh, of a copper we can uh, reuse. And uh, for the other thing, these are just as a methodology used for the exogenous uh, end use uh, I present in pink, if you remember. But the technology, the endogenous uh, sector, such as the power sector or, or, uh, or uh, transport, road transport, it is more easier because it's just uh, to relate it to, to an endogenous evolution inside the model. So we just need to implement the end of life recycling rate. And at the end, the model will know uh, to uh, which uh, part of uh, uh, how many uh, of, um, of the copper it could uh, reuse. And to avoid the double counting, we are just considering the new capacity installed and not uh, each year installed capacity to avoid the double uh, counting. I okay, I think uh, you yeah. kind of, yeah, you have kind of uh, answered the other points he was mentioning about double counting and the uh, differentiation between uh, um, dynamical um, evolution and uh, different uh, regions and technologies issues. Uh, I will go to the question from um, Tom Cober now uh, from PSI too, and um, uh, he was wondering what was driving the significant difference of bauxite consumption between two and four degree scenarios, Gondia. Uh, uh, yes, uh, because we, uh, we used, uh, for example, for the exogenous uh, end use, uh, we use econometric uh, analysis and uh, we just uh, uh, implement an evolution in the future according to, for example, taking into account uh, in some uh, report, we found uh, the evolution of uh, of the infrastructure. Uh, so uh, how they could uh, be used by uh, for aluminium. It's uh, in this way we consider, for example, for this uh, exogenous uh, uh, scenario. Because for for example, for uh, bauxite, uh, aluminium, we did not implement it only just for example for power sector. And also in uh, in uh, in road transport, but for the rest we did uh, the same uh, methodology using uh, economic econometric uh, methodology. So that's why. Okay, yeah. uh, I have a question to Kirsten, but I would like to tell to Jean-Michel Trochet that please write your question, and I will uh, I will be your uh, uh, the speaker for you. Uh, so um, from Tom Cober, Kirsten too. Uh, since you looked at several models and SDGs, are there models that explicitly take into consideration shifts in industrial production, which may have positive on welfare, positive impacts on welfare distribution and hence inspect several SDGs? Can you? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. But uh, I think that the models that we have looked most at in, uh, in my chapter in IPCC are sexual models. So uh, the model that should be able to answer your question is more an economic model, like some uh, sort of, um, and this is not the integrated assessment models either. So um, I'm not sure that I, I can really tell, but uh, there's a chapter where there's more material on macroeconomic models. So. Um, but I can't really reply on that. Maybe Nadia, you have some insights from your chapter. 
Not really. No, no because what I think would happen is also that as part of the economic growth, we know that emerging economies like China, India, Brazil, South Africa, and so forth are producing a lot of these um, the very emission and energy intensive products. And uh, I think that will still be the case. So uh, what I think happens in, I'm an economist by training. So my general idea is that uh, in the OECD countries, we have a lot of services in our economy and that will not be affected very much these uh, business sectors. So, uh, and then we have a few uh, very emission intensive sectors like the steel industry, uh, cement industry and uh, things like that. And uh, I don't think that they will be reallocated. So, but, but I know this was not a very um, a deep reply to that. Okay. Um... From Margaras uh, again uh, to Gonzia, how do you take into account competition on materials when feasible? Uh, for instance, copper versus aluminium in some application, and what is the impact of a time of resources scarcity on demand, for example, on consumer appliances or electric vehicle? So do you... Uh, well, uh, okay. this is one uh, limitation of uh, the modeling uh, exercise. We uh, we were we are not able to take into account uh, this uh, this aspect of uh, um, uh, of uh, the the competition between uh, two uh, two materials. I think we are just using the projection, the method, the econometric uh, projection, and endogenous evolution. Uh, we are considering it's uh, what we are we are having according to the evolution of the demand. So if you are considering other um, assumption, for example, we are saying copper will be replaced by aluminum. Even uh, some experts, they are considering aluminum is not so good in comparison to, to copper in terms of uh, to replace it uh, in, uh, in, in, first in power sector ne networks. So, um, it could be, uh, we could just uh, analyze another evolution of the demand and then we will have uh, another evolution of the criticality uh, uh, for sure. Okay. Um, okay, as far as we don't see the question from you, Jean-Michel arriving. I think we can uh, uh, thank again uh, our speakers and um, uh, close the session. But before you leave, uh, I would like uh, um, to remind you that uh, we will have uh, the next uh, uh, webinar on the... I don't want to uh, say something stupid. So it's going to be on the 20th of January, same time. And I would like uh, you to listen for... Uh, uh, one or two minutes to the presentation of this seminar uh, by uh, Vera uh, Sen from IER. Uh, so Vera, please, uh, if you want to introduce in few words the seminar. Thank you. Yes, sure. Um, I have also just one slide. Um, yeah, my name is Vera Sen. I'm from the Institute of Energy Economics from the University of Stuttgart. And um, the next webinar will be about energy and land use nexus. And um, it will be the same time that today. And we will take all those for uh, sustainable development goals. It's about um, affordable and clean energy, zero hunger, clean water, and life on land. And we will hear insights from three different models. So there will be two integrated assessment models and one energy system model. And uh, the presenters will share details about the methodologies and the data, how to integrate those uh, land system into energy system modeling. And of course, you will also hear some result insights. And I think it's especially in, uh, interesting for the net zero climate target scenario analysis, because there is this new demand for negative emissions and these technologies, they are um, mostly uh, land consuming. And yeah, you can still register.
for the webinar. Maybe someone can post the link again in the chat. And yeah, so I hope to see you next week there. Um, Alice will do that if she's still here. I think so. Um, and um, again, I would like to thank uh, everybody. So yes, we will have uh, the replay available. We will uh, um, post it on the ETSAP web. Uh, and uh, for those who want it, you just have to um, to write us to to us and. Um, also, I would like to thank you all again, and um, please save the following dates, 20th of January and 10th of February. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.